Mm -hmm. All right, welcome to the Digital Roundtable, and it's uh, October 14th, and it's been a fantastic um, week so far. The weather is amazing. I am super excited about the weather. Um, looking forward to fall. Uh, I have to uh, shout out and congratulations to the Lakers uh, for winning the weirdest NBA championship finals ever. A uh, bunch of grown men living in the same hotel in the same, <laughs> playing in the same court for four or five months. That was uh, kind of insane. Uh, I cannot imagine the stress and the pressure. Uh, uh, and, you know, we have a great guest today, uh, Angelo Angelou. And, uh, but, you know, you, we usually uh, get to start with music from John and his guitar. But John, today is in a special play. John, how are you? Tell us where you are. I'm fine. I'm at the Longhorn Football facility and I'm speaking to the uh, Longhorn football team at, at 2.30 and I'm going to have to dash out. So this is my first time back on campus since March the 14th. It's good to be here and my first time really dressing up from head to toe. So it's great to be here and look at all of the uh, stuff that's going on but more importantly observing all of the interaction between politics and science and what's going on in America with, with the COVID and it's very, very interesting to me as an up. There you go. There you go, John. Well, you know, wish, wish the Longhorns the best, and they should have run the table so they can go to a great bowl, maybe get picked at the very end for the, for the playoff championship. Who knows? Never know. Uh, Llewellyn, how are you today? You're muted, sir. No worries. No worries. There you go. No, I had to get out and get back in the vagaries of Zoom. Anyway, I'm very well, thank you. Appreciate your inquiry. Lovely day here in Rhode Island, also known as East Texas. Okay, okay. Glad to have you. And then we have Angelo Angelou. Angelo, how are you? I'm doing terrific. Excellent. Well, Angelo Angelou is a superstar. He has been in the world of economic development, entrepreneurship, and predicting the future of success of companies for a long time. He's one of those uh, players that helped Kosmeski and John Butler and many others architect the growth and success of Austin. And uh, he was the vice president of economic development and chief economist at the Greater Chamber of Commerce for a long time. And they decided to create his own company called Angelou Economics. And then about 10 years ago or so, decided to create an international accelerator. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hear what he has to say about some of his companies and innovation and where he thinks the world is going. But before we get there, uh, and welcome again, Angelos. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, we uh, always review what's going on in the world real quick to get a glimpse of uh, how we're doing e economically and, and with the pandemic. So COVID death are up roughly 5,000 deaths from last week. It is trending slightly down week over week uh, versus last week. And then in terms of the all cases, uh, it is up 350,000 um, cases up and it's trending slightly up. So cases are trending up and you're seeing in the news that it's been a flare of, of cases going up a little bit, but the death in, in general, trending down, that may be an impact of the therapeutics and whatever else is being used out there. Uh, the stock market is up uh, on, on all fronts. The Dow is up 300 points. The New York Stock Exchange Index is up 150 points. The NASDAQ is up 400 points. Crude oil is uh, down 26 cents at uh, $40 in one cent. Okay, so production at $40, still a reasonable number for uh, all, the fr all the fracking and all the uh, production that is going on. Um, and then prices of gas in our greater Austin area are at $1.67. That is six cents up from last week. Still crazy, 167 is super cheap. 
Um, so that's kind of fascinating. Uh, the other two things, the three things to remember, remind of us is that we added, or, or you know, the country added 661,000 jobs in September for a total of uh, 11 million uh, point, uh, 161 million uh, jobs added since May. And unemployment is hovering at around 7.8%. So John, what, what do you think is going on? Uh, how are we doing? How is the recovery? Uh, how do you see things? Well, I don't see a recovery. I see going back to the middle of March. Remember, this is the first time in history where we have had a pandemic in the morning time, that is, since the mm -hmm. you know, 1918, superimposed, if you will, on the economy. And it's a observation in human will, the reality of science and the future. And I think that uh, as the numbers go back up, it means that we're going back to the practices that we were doing uh, six months ago. And you can also see some things going on when we would say it's going to be business as usual. So I think that what we're doing is, is looking at, for the most part, what companies can survive during this pandemic. And as you pointed out, the stock market is certainly an indication that some things are going well. We have talked about the fact that some people are at home working and then others are exposed. Therefore, there is a higher probability of getting the virus. And so what I see going on in everything is the human beings not realizing that we do have a virus. And the biggest indication of what we might be in the future is that the numbers are going up for the infection. Right. Now, the other thing, of course, we've got a lot more smarter with treatment. We've got a lot, a lot more smarter on, on the aggregate with masks. So it's the most interesting things that's happening when you look at economics and, and the social of it, and actually the tendencies of human beings who do not want to be pin up all of the time. And of course, all of that is saying people must make a living. So how do you choose? These things are difficult when it comes to, are you gonna get killed by the pandemic? Are you gonna, get, are you gonna starve to death? It is one of the most interesting times in the history of the world since the 1918. But of course, at this time, we are connected. So therefore, I could be in Austin today and London tomorrow and Tibet the next day. So when you look at the connectivity and the reality, we're still in a bad kind of way, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Got it. Llewellyn? Well, I, as usual, I tend to agree with John. I think things are a lot worse than the numbers you read out. And I think the stock market is a very, at this point in time, very deceptive indicator. I think that we're coming into winter, we're going to see a surge of infections. Life is going to get a lot harder for all of us. Those of us who have the good fortune to be able to go out from time to time, say, to an outdoor restaurant, that's going to be severely curtailed. We're trying here in Rhode Island with propane heaters and things, but it's not working for everyone or everywhere. Uh, it's going to be a very, very difficult winter on top of which we have the election. And of course, at the moment, we're not getting any news at all or hardly a drop of news because we're so preoccupied with the confirmation hearing for Judge Barrett. Uh, it is a very difficult time in the history of the country, in the history of the world. Uh, some good things will happen. I think there'll be a huge surge of innovation, there'll be many new products, many startup companies, and alas, a large, almost permanent uh, a rump of unemployed people at the low end of the economic scale who won't have any work. One, because of the confluence of things at the top of it, of course, COVID, but right behind that, we have technology beginning to move into the job market subtracting jobs, which is never done here to far, how to fall throughout all of the industrial history of the world. But uh, we have AI, uh, machine learning, stepchild, and uh, uh, it's a very difficult period of change. I think we'll come out of it with a great many new companies, new products, new ideas. Question mark, will there be 
enough new employment. Mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. Angelo, you just got back from Europe and you work with uh, international executives all across the world. And what's your take? Uh, give us a perspective from as a European and coming from Europe, obviously you live here too. So give us, give us your thoughts. Well, I was uh, in Greece visiting my mom, who is uh, ill, but I also took a side trip to Georgia be uh, at the invitation of the Minister of the Economy. And um, these are two countries which have been the least affected by COVID-19, although the toll on the economy is evident everywhere, uh, particularly on the tourism and retail sector. Um, Europe is going through a second wave here and, um, you know, everyone is concerned and there is talk about in the UK of uh, shutting down. Uh, there is talk about in Spain and um, Italy perhaps. So um, everyone is kind of on the edge um, trying to figure out what will happen from day to day and what the, the separate governments will be announcing. Mm -hmm. um, the good news is that um, the people in serious condition all over Europe are about uh, 11,200 or so. In the U.S., the numbers were as low as 14,100 a week ago uh, or so, and now there are over 15,000 again. That mm -hmm. number had been as, as high as 17,000. So while people are getting sick, they're not necessarily um, patients that go into the critical segment of um, treatment. So that, that is the good news. The bad news is um, no one really has the answer. Uh, it's been a, quite a disappointment. Um, and I believe that disappointment is primarily fed up by politicians thinking that we're gonna have a vaccine ready um, no, first AstraZeneca, now Johnson & Johnson. It doesn't appear that we're any close to a vaccine for this year, um, maybe next year, and there will be more testing. <clears throat> and the vaccine, by the way, it's not going to be an immediate cure. Right. COVID-19 is going to take probably six months to nine months before people trust it. Right. and uh, vaccinate themselves. Yeah. Um, more of what we need is a combination of vaccine and therapies that will take people out of the critical uh, care and hopefully lead them to recovery. Mm -hmm. So uh, from a COVID-19 perspective, um, it's not over yet, and I don't expect it to be over anytime soon. From an economic recovery point of view, the European economies uh, have been slightly hurt more so than the US, um, but that is not to say that the hurt in the US in, it's in any way um, something that we should um, take lightly. I don't expect a full recovery for our economy until 2022, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not going to be a full recovery to what we were. It's going to be a different, a new normal, if you will. Mm -hmm. There are some sectors like technology uh, that will be breaking record, records mm -hmm. in the stock market as well as in revenue. A good example of that is, uh, uh, you know, Facebook and, and Google and Apple and Microsoft all had record uh, earnings at a time when the US GDP was down by a little over 30%. Mm -hmm. um, so there is um, three speeds to our economy uh, towards recovery. There is the high tech sector that is going to continue to grow and um, there's, there are no problems there. Then there is an innovation sector that is also getting um, a lot of venture capital and angel funding that is doing very, very well. It is a traditional industry as well. It's airlines, aerospace, um, the entertainment sector, restaurants and, and food establishments, as well as live events that are really taking the brunt of uh, the COVID-19 recession. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. so it's going to take some time before people can feel comfortable uh, to go out and eat or spend. Mm -hmm. um, and how much time, it's everyone's guess. But uh, definitely is not coming before Christmas right. or in the middle of next year. I think it's going to so, take so is it, is it fair to say that for the international accelerator and the startup world, uh, things are faster now, uh, things are happening, or how, how would you characterize it? Well, um, I think the international accelerator is doing extremely well. Um, we are getting more applicants because, you know, COVID-19 has slowed down other parts of the world just as as here, but still the U.S. is the best place to acquire capital um, for growing startups, and everyone wants to be here. The unfortunate thing is that they cannot physically all be here. So we began working with six new companies, basically remotely, and trying to promote them and raise capital for them. Um, hopefully the travel restrictions will be lifted sometime in the first quarter, maybe, Mm -hmm. uh, of next year, but um, we can work with them from from here remotely. Not as right. well, but I would say trying to do our best to work yeah. with them. I, I'm curious, uh, I know that you talk to a lot of folks and the accelerator gets uh, inquiries from all over. I wonder if you have been uh, considering or talk to anybody that has, uh, you know, lots of energy from places like Zimbabwe. You know anybody from there? Um, no, I believe we may have gotten a few uh, applicants from Zimbabwe, but none of them really made it to our, our program. And Andrea, you know this uh, very well. We discussed this before. Mm -hmm. You know, last year we got over a thousand applicants from more than 30 countries around the world. We only accept 10, 10 companies into our program every year. So right. it's, um, it's a big filter. It's very, very filtered, and they have to be exceptional to make it into our program. Yeah. Uh, Llewellyn, any, any thoughts or comments for questions for Angelos? Well, I have lots of questions. First, I, I'd like Andrea to tell us just a little more or tell me uh, about the accelerator. Then I'd like to uh, ask him some questions about Europe. Uh, fortunately, I know both Greece and uh, to a lesser extent. Uh, yeah. Food and an interest in both of them. I'm wondering about the future of the European Union, whether the adversity, first for Brexit and second for COVID, has united it, or whether it is, as it sometimes appears, to be disintegrating, and how nations are going to bear up under the enormous debt that they will now incur, even when they're looking at possibly coming out of the COVID with more than 200 uh, uh, 200% of our GDP of our, uh, in, in debt. Uh, it's a new period, but we're also looking at debt differently. It doesn't seem to be driving inflation as it has. So I'd like to hear something about all of those things, which are an awful lot, and I would yield my time happily to John because he has. Yeah. So, Angela, tell us real quick, uh, walk us through the top four companies in the accelerator right now. What do they do? What, well, what are they? Uh, first, let me provide an introduction. Yeah. Um, you know, when uh, six years ago, when I wanted to, to get involved with accelerating companies, we decided that we needed to be different. And therefore, our accelerator only recruits international startups. Uh, there is plenty of places for U.S. entrepreneurs to go to. Um, God knows um, Austin has a plethora of uh, co-working spaces and incubators to go, but there is not a place that is focused on foreign-born entrepreneurs. We had a great exit um, a couple of months ago with a company called Restream.io. Uh, we sold uh, three-quarters of our shares, and... Um, paid off all of our investors, their principal plus interest. Um, and we still have 12 more companies uh, that uh, we expect uh, some exits in, in the near future. Um, the top companies that we have right now is Big Time, which is a, a free appointment calendar company. I think this is potentially a unicorn company 
they're growing with 15,000, uh, acquiring 15,000 new businesses per month as of last month. They have 150,000 businesses already using that platform. And they're creating a CRM around uh, the ability to uh, market uh, small businesses using their calendar, basically. Uh, sending reminders, sending offers of discounts and so forth and so on. So uh, I think they're going to be a very, very strong player with uh, now strategic relationships, relationships established with both Google and PayPal. Um, the other company is Strap Tech. Uh, Strap Technologies is uh, founded from a Mexican very young entrepreneur, 18 year old uh, kid. Um, they've developed um, a vest with sensors that I enable blind people to be more independent. They don't have to use the cane anymore. And the goal is um, to have uh, someone run a half marathon without any assistance. Wow. Um, they're terrific. And they've won every competition that they've entered. Uh, in the wow. US and abroad. Wow. Um, and hopefully second quarter of next year we'll start shipping product, which um, they have already pre-sold $30,000 worth of product. Mm -hmm. um, the other one is pick, uh, the other one is B readers. Um, this is the fastest um, company that we've had to achieve revenue and substantial revenue. They joined our program in uh, January. Uh, they started monetizing their platform in late March. And I think wow. they're expected to top a $1 million in revenue from during, March to December. During COVID time. During COVID time. Um, they are obviously a online play. Yeah. Um, it's um, a K through 12 um, Spanish comprehension platform. And uh, we have several big players now talking to them about acqu acquisition. Sure. Um, this company is going to be at a $5 million pace probably in a couple of years. They're doing mm -hmm. extremely well. Mm -hmm. And I'm very, very proud of them. And the last, uh, another company that we have is called VisionBot. Um, they are an artificial intelligence company that recognizes objects, not from a security perspective, but for a business improvement process. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think they're going to do terrific. Unfortunately, they have not yet been able to make it here. And I should not leave out another company from the UK. Uh, it's called Simpils. They are an accounting platform that sits between the accounting software of uh, a client and their vendors and automatically reconciliates all invoices and payments. So it reduces uh, probably 90% uh, of the time that it takes to reconciliate accounts and therefore 90% savings in cost. Right. And I think they're gonna do terrific. Great. There you go, Llewellyn. Now that's very interesting. Tell me, uh, Angelo, about the European Union. Is it getting stronger or is it uh, weakened? Well, my sense is um, that the European Union has always been what it is. It's a loose association of countries, um, you know, with uh, a lot of national views of how it should be run. There is a monetary union, but um, they don't dictate economic policy necessarily just like our Federal Reserve Bank does. Uh, is it gonna go away? Absolutely not. I don't aspire. I mean, we've been talking about the dissolution of the European Union uh, two years after it started <laughs> and it has not happened. It will not, in fact, in my view, it has been strengthened with the exit uh, from uh, Great Britain because Great Britain never was really in. It was one foot in, one foot out. And I think now that they are out, uh, the European Union is going to be strengthened. Thank you. So, so, I mean, from, a, from an economic perspective, um, you know, let me also talk about um, in comparing apples to apples. 
Today, uh, the U.S. economy is more indebted than the European Union is. The European Union on average, mm -hmm. uh, including countries like Greece, where th they are over 300% in debt uh, to GDP. Overall, the European Union is only indebted by about uh, 88%. And the U.S. is over 107, 108% today. Um, so, uh, you know, we have as much of a debt problem as uh, or more than the European Union does. Mm. Gotcha, gotcha. So let me, so let me uh, circle back to some of the interesting happenings this last seven days uh, as we keep tracking digital transformation and, and how to navigate the waters of that. So you probably saw the announcement from Apple yesterday. They announced their iPhone 12, uh, the iPhone 12, the iPhone 12 mini, the iPhone 12 Pro, the iPhone 12 Pro Max, beautiful colors, phenomenal features, incredible performance, all supporting 5G. They had the CEO of Verizon on stage. Uh, CNBC had all the other carriers on interviews. The stock market went nuts. Uh, the prediction is that 5G is going to, you know, cook us all because of the microwave signals and everybody's going to go and rush and buy one of these phones and, uh, and 5G is going to take over the world. Uh, interestingly enough, the carriers are already uh, mm -hmm. moving forward to the next step in AT&T and T-Mobile and Verizon and other carriers have formed a new alliance called Next Gen, focused on bringing to the market 6G technology. <laughs> so, so 5G hasn't even started, and the carriers are already talking about 6G. And obviously, that's you know that's the name of the game for keeping the stock market happy. Uh, another important uh, happening here for a local company in your headquarters. Uh, we're, we're the big foot presence here. AMD uh, uh, is uh, about to acquire a company called Silink for uh, $30 billion. And Silink is one of those uh, chip manufacturers that makes uh, machine learning uh, silicon uh, that is the biggest thing going on uh, as it relates to uh, 5G and, and connectivity and, and mobile devices and all that. And, and then uh, uh, the, another interesting note on, on telecom, uh, the U.S. Army signed an agreement to deploy FirstNet, which is a 4G technology that uh, is managed by at and as a private network, uh, and it's being deployed at 72 bases for the U.S. Army to provide, you know, independent connectivity from the Internet uh, to the Department of Defense. Uh, and then last but not least, Samsung and KDDI are cooperating in Japan to deliver 5G, private 5G networks to Japanese companies. So again, one of the big things about 5G is not just us tweeting each other, but the bigger future of 5G is uh, industrial IoT connected devices, billions, hundreds of billions of things, and that would require private networks. So given, given uh, Given the fact that, you know, while we still have so many unknowns and so many people that work in the fashion industry and the food industry and the hospitality industry, they don't have jobs, airlines, uh, uh, high tech is going through the roof at, a, at, a, at an accelerated pace. We've said that COVID has probably accelerated 10 years of adoption and transformation. What is you guys' take, especially you, Angela, coming from Europe, what's your take on 5G and Apple introducing their phones and all this stuff. But what do people say in Europe? What's going on with 5G and telecom and IoT? Well, I, I will um, add to your comment. Mm -hmm. The U.S. is actually fairly behind on the adoption of 5G. Mm -hmm. So maybe we need to leapfrog and uh, hopefully beat Asia on the implementation of 6G. Now, 6G was announced also by China a year ago. So uh, I don't really know what uh, they've got uh, in, in mind there. Um, as far as um, 5G and, and what it will do to the electronics industry and the telecom industry, I think uh, the realization is 
that uh, the telecom companies want to hook in new customers mm -hmm. or maybe retain their base. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are offering all these uh, free phones and huge discounts that I have never seen before. Right. So I think uh, this will lead to a, an explosive quarter for Apple. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily individuals buying more phones, but um, in individuals taking the opportunity to upgrade uh, through all the um, yeah. discounts now that are offered by the telecom companies. Yeah. So um, I don't, you know, at the same time, I'm reading a 5G phone um, will not necessarily give you a higher speed. It will be um, fractional of a, a fraction of an increase. Uh, the places where the infrastructure is in place are very few, uh, still in, in limited uh, mm -hmm. uh, locations and cities. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, 5G has a, probably a two or three year run before it's fully implemented in the U.S. Sure. Um, I, I was reading today that only about 29% of the U.S. is covered by 5G, and there are also varying technologies of 5G. Right. Um, which is, uh, we need to make a distinction. China is at 50%, and uh, hopefully um, by the end of the year, uh, both, both countries will get to 100%. But uh, it's, it's something to be, to be seen. Great, great. Llewellyn, any, any thoughts and comments on, on the, the, the Dev Telecom journey? I'm, I'm interested in, in asking either of you, but how is economics changing? The, econ the Economist magazine has said there's been a sort of rethink, and a lot of the old verities in the economics are, are now being questioned, one of which is the amount of debt that the country can carry before it becomes inflation. We're well, seeing huge debt, as, as Andrew has just said, and yet we aren't seeing any suggestion that inflation is growing. Uh, I also want to ask Andrew, how long can we go on with essentially negative or non-existent interest rates? And sometimes doesn't money have to have a, a price tag attached to it? Angela? Um, sure. Well, uh, interest rates are near zero, which means that uh, we don't have the tool of a monetary policy being able to affect um, anything else that we may have to have intervention. Um, the Federal Reserve Bank now is the only uh, stimulus that really we have, uh, and their balance sheet has exploded in recent years. Um, the, um, the challenge that I see is we've added $7 trillion to our debt just through uh, COVID alone. Um, probably another billion or two with a new stimulus package whenever Congress decides to do it. Um, and, um, and, and yet that is only patching aspects of our economy. Um, really incentivizing consumption um, and not production. And uh, that is extremely worrisome from, from my point of view. Um, when, when I look at the debt in China, and by the way, they are highly indebted as well, I see huge infrastructure projects. <laughs> Um, I don't see debt going into subsidized consumption or incentivized consumption. In the U.S., I, I don't see any of our debt having gone to build some modern infrastructure anywhere. Uh, that's not a federal expense. So that is, is a huge difference, I think, between, between debt in other countries and debt in our country. Yeah, I'm, really, I'm concerned. Yeah, I think that's very serious. Um, I wonder... We've seen this enormous and almost endless boom in high tech, which can also be called maybe electromagnetic tech, uh, but nothing else. We have all kinds of new materials, uh, now manufacturing, yet it hasn't re uh, manifested itself economically the way that 
computers of all sorts and uh, electromagnetic communications have. And I wonder, are we going to see a time when suddenly you're going to have a boom in, say, materials, changing the way we do things? And could such a boom, could new materials possibly stimulate the infrastructure construction we need? Well, I think um, the drivers of our economy is going to be innovation and the major tech companies. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, uh, you know, hopefully they will pull along the rest of the economy. And if COVID-19 subsides, then we may begin to see growth in all the other sectors that have seen the brunt of COVID-19. But um, the other thing that has to take place is, you know, the U.S. is the number one exporting power in the world. And no true recovery will occur if the rest of the world is still dealing with COVID-19. Right. Uh, depressed economies cannot be importing stuff from the U.S. So it's going to take a while uh, before we see a full new normal, and we don't know what that is. And my prediction is it's going to take probably uh, another year and a half, maybe two, to, to get to that point. Yeah. But uh, no doubt that technology is going to find solutions to dealing with COVID through either vaccine or therapies that might uh, help out the situation. Uh, 5G certainly now is uh, <laughs> a hot item. Uh, and I think that will fuel the economy. Um, you know, when Apple, Apple alone adds almost uh, half a percent to the U.S. GDP, if they have a, a pretty good uh, year this year and next. Um, so, and exports in total add another 1% to uh, the growth in our uh, GDP. Um, yeah. I'm, um, flattered actually and, and feel a, a little bit differently than most. The savings rate in the U.S. has gone up much uh, higher than it's ever been. And I don't necessarily see that as bad news. Um, you know, we've... We've had a savings rate of 4% um, dealing with um, the previous recession. Uh, and uh, before that, we had a negative savings rate. Uh, Europe has always had more of a savings um, balance system than we did. And Asia, by the way, almost saves 30% of all income uh, earned. Europe saves about 13%. Mm -hmm. And that's pre-COVID. And now it may be a lot more as well. Um, the job market, God, um, I, I don't know what to say there. For how long can we be patching the airline sector, the retail sector? Um, a lot of the retail businesses have already gone out of businesses, uh, particularly the uh, restaurant and other retail. So it's just going to be part of the... Uh, process of businesses that were not in good standing to begin with or marginally profitable, they're definitely going to go out of business and close down. And hopefully that would allow for new entrepreneurs to come to play and benefit from a resurgence in the economy a couple of years from now. Yeah. Let, let me pause here and uh, share my screen and, and do my little 30 second commercial on uh, uh, reminding everybody that we did our Digital 360 Summit and it was very successful. Uh, we had um, uh, 900 people register. Uh, we had a phenomenal number of speakers and sessions. And, uh, and uh, these are the list of companies that spoke on keynotes and panels. And it was uh, quite an ordeal. And we do that in partnership CMG with Texas State. Uh, and then our next uh, annual summit is going to be face to face. We hope, not from Wood, May 18th, 19th, and 20th uh, in San Marcos. Uh, and it's going to be a little bigger. Uh, we're expecting a thousand folks and uh, 80 speakers plus, and it's going to be fantastic. Uh, and I want to thank Texas State University for um, uh, hosting the digital roundtable. So. Um, Angelos and, and, and Llewellyn, uh, you know, clearly um, 
there are winners and losers on what's going on. There is a significant amount of population that needs to be retrained. I think the business of retraining, uh, uh, you know, a vocational school, uh, people wanting to be, you know, plumbers, electricians, uh, solar panel installers. I think that that's going to be something that should be, you know, in the up and up. And, and, and it's got clearly something that needs to be rethought in terms of how do you take a lot of uh, people in their 40s and 50s and, and teach them new skills. But but uh, let me let me share a couple more elements of uh, transformation that are happening this week. So uh, uh, a new report came out and said that uh, smart buildings and, 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 and what is called sustainable buildings, you know, we're building these new labs that fix the state that are net zero, zero energy, zero water, zero waste. That uh, a lot of folks are saying that in order for that to become a reality that uh, that uh, the code and the, the, the laws and the legalese around every city and, and safety and all that, and a lot of things need to change because today just there is no incentive from the developer point of view to build smart buildings and they consume less energy and all of the above. So there seems to be a need for a phenomenal transformation, which I, I predict, and we have talked about it, the COVID will drive that, right? The, the, we, we all know the commercial real estate's kind of dead. Uh, movie, movie theaters are dead. Uh, there's all kinds of real estate that need to be retrofitted and transformed into, you know, I guess living quarters and, and the like. I think that the notion of having building towers full of, a, a, you know, a office space is, is, is not a good strategy anymore. Uh, big airports are in trouble. All, all kinds of you know, new places need to be rethought, reinvented, reimagined. Um, on, on the smart cities front, real quick, uh, there's a, a, a prediction of a battery boom to happen by 2040. Uh, Gigafactory is being built. You know, Tesla is building one now in Texas. Um, EV Connect, uh, a, a, a charging company, announced a new partner program. Enel, the Italian uh, company that has operations here in the U.S., has done a partnership with Home Depot globally, and they're selling a package in Home Depot for where you can go in and buy a solar panel and energy storage from Enel through Home Depot, and you know DIY, do it yourself at home, install your own thing, be up and running, and let you know walk off the grid kind of thing. What 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 are you what are you all take on? retraining the workforce, uh, reinventing things, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, things like electric vehicles are accelerating, changing, you know, the GPU loops of the world. What, what, what do you all see is gonna happen there? And, and how, do we take, how do we turn that into an opportunity? Well, let me, uh, I don't know if I, would, if I can turn, on, turn it into an opportunity, but I certainly don't think you can train a very large part of the workforce or retrain. I think once people get into their 40s and 50s, what you have to do is to look at skills they have that you may not know that they have. Mm -hmm. Drive. Maybe there's a job driving, uh, no longer working in a restaurant. That is an attendance skill, a tertiary skill. You don't mm -hmm. train them, you have to retrain them in the requirements of that job, but you don't have to really retrain them in a very fundamental way. Mm -hmm. For example, I don't think we're going to take uh, use the restaurant worker or say the say the the attendant on an airline. Uh, you're not going to really retrain them to build out 5G, but you may be able to use those skills that they already have and may not know they have in telephone work, or as in telephone sales, or, uh, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. I think you've got to look to the skills that people already have and amplify those skills. I don't think you start with a brand new skill and say, hey, you'll be great fixing computers after six months course, because they won't. And they won't be happy and they won't be comfortable. And the older they are, the less dignity they will feel in the retraining. And people who have jobs that they feel no dignity in don't do them very well. It's a very unhappy situation. How this will work out, we don't know. I think Andrew is quite right that this is not, and we've said it on this broadcast before, this is not going to be a V-shaped recovery. We're not going to wake up one morning and say, hey, we're back where we were in 2019. 
It's not going to happen. Some things are going to be very much more advanced. There are going to be some huge breakthroughs in tech. There are going to be a lot of startups. I don't mean they're all going to be tech startups. Uh, there are lots of things happening uh, as a result of COVID and offer room for startups. Delivery services, for example. Drones are coming. They're high tech and they also require an awful lot of structure. And initially, will require a lot of capital in order to manufacture a serviceable drone that makes deliveries. And then there are social issues associated with that, which will involve a lot of people, including lawyers and engineers, um, as to how they, they're not all going to go to your house and fly in the window. That can't be done. Central points, probably. Uh, we're on a period of huge change. I think <laughs> parts of the economy that are lagging now will still lag transportation, hospitality. Others that have been fairly sleepy will speed up, including new materials. And I think a point will come fairly soon, no matter who wins the election. And it's very difficult to talk about these issues without realizing that there is a political dimension to. Um, we'll have to take the infrastructure seriously. It may, in fact, be driven infrastructure uh, rebuilding, which involves everything from electric supply to roads to bridges, uh, and indeed to getting just uh, uh, 5G or even just broadband to remote areas, is going to be driven mainly by, by the climate. Maybe as we start trying to adapt to the new climate, we will adapt other things as well. It's all up for grabs. It's an exciting, frightening, difficult time. Angelo. Um, the U.S. undoubtedly has the most uh, dynamic economy in the world, and we have been a labor retraining market for many, many years. The situation, however, here is a bit different. And... Uh, you know, which industries do you retrain for? Maybe the, the call centers, maybe the um, online uh, industry that is growing very, very fast. The other indicator would be, where would the US government be spending money for infrastructure? We need to get out of uh, trying to incentivize consumption. We need to get into the business of creating infrastructure mm -hmm. that will help the country recover um, and hopefully create new jobs for the future so that people that are currently unemployed can be looking forward to be re, being re-employed again. Right. So um, it's, a, it's a complicated uh, because we've never uh, have experienced in anything like that. Honestly speaking, I think that what we now know about COVID um, had we known it uh, in March, uh, probably we would have never shut down the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, we would have uh, made sure that the senior citizen centers are all well protected. Our medical staff is well protected um, and had the equipment to, uh, to work with, as well as um, maybe anyone else who is um, uh, many other risk factors. Uh, we could have focused on testing those first. And, um, uh, you know, but um, hindsight is always 2020. Uh, we were forced to shut down the economy and created uh, not only uh, the situation that we're in today, but uh, the rest of the world followed uh, with this same example, with the exception of a couple of countries like Sweden and others. Um, but it is what it is. Uh, we're in a hole right now. We've got to get out of it. But I firmly believe that uh, eventually the U.S. economy is going to recover, um, is going to grow, and is going to be stronger than ever before. I mean, we've been through this many times before. Uh, this is a country that understands risk and at the same time rewards opportunity. So there will be many, many opportunities to yeah. We also should look to a growth in healthcare and biomedical research and ultimately uh, exportable biomedical discoveries, medicines, etc. Uh, COVID is the bright side of COVID, if there is any such thing possible, 
is that there is a huge boom in pure research in biotech and in bio issues, including biotechnology. All sorts of exciting things are happening that I've done a little reporting on, not enough. But one is the merging of biology and engineering. Uh, and uh, we're going to see a lot of growth there, a lot of startups and some mm -hmm. really a lot of money made. Uh, I'm looking at two companies involved in that, and I think they're doing very interesting things. Whether they will make it in the market, I'm not sure. But certainly, this kind of research makes a difference, and it's a whole dimension that will possibly take its place next to some of the excitement we've had about computers and communications. Absolutely, absolutely. So the, la so the last thing that we always check is how is the smart energy transformation going? And, uh, and on that one, National Grid, uh, it's working, has decided to work on hydrogen. And many utilities are looking at hydrogen as, um, as dealing with um, heavy vehicles uh, where electrification probably is not practical. Um, so it's interesting to see the national grid, both uh, in the UK and here, is looking at that. Uh, they're also focused on zero, a zero carbon footprint as a company by 2050. Um, yet another company that is committing to putting a sand, in, uh, you know, a line in the sand and saying no more CO2 emissions uh, going forward at a certain time frame. Uh, real quick, Sunrun closed the acquisition of Vivint. This is all about smart homes and the like. Um, FERC, um, it's uh, had a long conference online, 2,000 uh, people participated for eight hours in a dialogue about create, uh, can, can, a, can a carbon pricing economy be created? Uh, how do we go about that? So the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission hosted a conference last week, there were 2,000 experts, it spent nine hours talking about the topic. It seems to be an interesting time to be talking about that. Um, San Diego Gas and Electric just submitted a new plan to the PUC in California for uh, being a sustainable utility that includes improvements in their smart grid. And obviously, we have heard all the dismays and issues in California with not having such very smart grids and creating fires everywhere. Uh, and then New Duke and Xterra Energy are about to merge. Uh, those are two humongous companies, um, two $40 billion companies merging, creating, you know, yet one, one super large uh, nationwide um, uh, power company. Uh, and the M&A elements uh, continue to be aggressive. This is uh, seem to be a good time to be merging and buying things uh, for uh, pennies on the dollar. Uh, and then uh, the last thing uh, related to hydrogen is the Idaho Laboratory, Idaho National Lab has uh, basically uh, started a new program for making green hydrogen. So it seems like hydrogen is going to be it's in the up and up uh, in addition to electrification of vehicles and, and the energy guys are transforming themselves from traditional burning coal or just power or just oil companies into a broad range of energy offerings and the like. So what, given the fact that energy is so important and, and it's really you know, a key building block of any energy, of any transformation, and obviously as we use more uh, in you know, electronics, we need more electricity. What are you guys' take on, on the fact that uh, it seems like the infrastructure and the, and the big players are spending a ton of money and transforming themselves, not waiting for what that new future looks like? I, I want to uh, just uh, uh, intercede here. Uh, there was a question came in, which is, uh, which were the two uh, biotechnology companies I was recommending? And only one of them do I know the exact name. That's Marban, M-A-R-B-A-N, Therapeutics in Los Angeles. Very, very interesting little company. And the other one will have to uh, write me separately and I'll get the correct name and call it to the... Uh, well, I um, like actually a company that I have personally invested uh, some money in the stock market. It's called TG Therapeutics. Uh, they have probably a dozen or so candidates for FDA approval, all in the direction of providing cures for different uh, cancers. 
Mm -hmm. um, it was recommended to me about six months ago. I bought it and they've been doing very, very well. Um, <clears throat> I also like one of our own, which is still a startup and I'm trying to raise some money. Um, and it is a company from India that is called Neil Agil and they're working on a, a new drug delivery method. They've received patents in the US in record time, which is unheard of on a new pathway to uh, allowing insulin to be delivered via a pill in your body, no more injections. Oh, wow. And um, more so, it's not just insulin, it's any other injectable. Um, that, that actually would be a tremendous advance. Mm -hmm. You can see Medi uh, uh, the infusions, a lot of diseases are treated with infusions where you have to sit in a chair or lie in a bed with a drip feed if it can go to a pill, that is a gigantic advance. And mm -hmm. Correct. So that's uh, what they've been working on. There was a pretty good article on the Austin American Statesman uh, a year ago about them. I mean, uh, I think they have a lot of promise, but coming from India and not being able to travel to the U.S., they've been literally unable to raise a couple hundred thousand dollars that they need to, to get on with uh, the research a little bit further. Right, 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 right. Um, to go back to hydrogen, if you'd like me to do that. Yeah. Hydrogen is very hot in Europe. Uh, uh, there's a huge steam in the North Sea to use wind to uh, generate electricity, to use the surplus or the slack uh, to generate hydrogen, which will be fed into the European natural gas system, particularly in Holland, because they're They've got a piping there, which is particularly appropriate for natural for hydrogen. Hydrogen is not the same as natural gas. It has a lower energy density and a smaller molecule. So it's a lot more difficult to handle. And if we're having problems with methane leaks now, which we're having throughout the natural gas system, you're going to get some stunning leaks when you start putting mm -hmm. hydrogen into old pipes. So, a lot of infrastructure is going to be needed, and probably some new approaches to plumbing these things. Right. There's always, the, it takes a while for the, the, the tertiary, the, the things we depend on to catch up to the basic uh, direction. And the direction is towards hydrogen, uh, and we're going to see more of it, eventually green hydrogen. In the interim, in this country, what's called blue hydrogen, which is actually natural gas that has been reformed into hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So Andre, my question to you is, um, I mean, there are automobile manufacturers now that are counting on hydrogen and there are gas stations that are providing it. Yep. I mean, uh, some of the safety issues may still be there by and large, but a lot of them have been solved. And uh, it appears that hydrogen may be the choice of fuel for aircraft, uh, commercial aircraft in the future. Right, right. Yeah, I think that I think that that's where things are heading. I think that clearly the electrification of all economies, all industries is in an up and up with digitalization, computers, sensors everywhere. And, 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 and uh, but there are certain jobs and certain use cases, heavy transport and what have you, where you know electrification and batteries will never do it, so you need you know fuel cells and hydrogen in a new way. And also, so, beginning to think of how we're going to dispose of all these millions and millions of batteries, which are pretty toxic. That's mm -hmm. right. Well, you know, one of, one of the co-founders of Tesla just left Tesla, and to start a new company that is all about recycling batteries, uh, and. Uh, getting rid of cobalt and lithium ion and whatever else happens in those batteries is nasty stuff, right? And uh, maybe maybe that's why we need to go colonize Mars so we can send our trash to Mars. <laughs> Who knows? But uh, but clearly, you know, we, we keep saying over and over that, you know, uh, while it is uh, really rough for a lot of folks uh, that um, listen to us and and are in the middle of witnessing the, the divide on, on digitalization and, and uh, earnings uh, as COVID has really um, kind of, you know, really created a wedge uh, with a lot of people. We see at the same time, a lot of uh, possibilities, a lot of innovation. And we think that it's new business models, entrepreneurship, innovation, 
the answer to all this, uh, you know, sort of bad news. And, and so we keep looking for, you know, as we invite guests, and we keep looking for the, the answers and the wisdom. And so, Angela, we, we want to thank you for being here today uh, and sharing. Thank you for uh, the invitation. Sh sharing, it's an honor to meet you. It's a real honor, Angela. Sharing, sharing oh, a bit you. about what's happening in the world. And we, we will uh, make sure that our folks can uh, listen to this uh, as they do on demand afterwards. Uh, and find out more about your international accelerator and then Deloitte Economics and, and all the companies that you're promoting and, 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 and helping be successful. We thank you for all the, all the, all the leadership that you uh, do quietly. You're a, a, a great steward of, of uh, the human race. So thank you for being here. Thank you. And, uh, you know, we usually have a, a closing gap with the music and some singing and <laughs> Llewellyn gets all excited and sings when John is playing, but we don't have that today, Llewellyn. So Llewellyn, you want to say, you know, no, no, you I just, don't, you I don't say, to, I'll say to Angelo, Opa. Opa, I, 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 I said <laughs> How do you, how do you close off, how do you close off the White, the White House Chronicles? I say cheers. And cut the power. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Cheers and cut the power. See you guys. Right. Thank Bye. you for being here today. We're Thank off. You. Thank Bye. you. Bye.